into Luke chapter 15 and verse 2. This is the third week out of four um, that we've been on this particular text, and we'll stay there. As I've told you, it's probably going to be sometime up into August uh, that we're going to be in this series, and we're just going through the ministry of Christ in the Gospels where that Christ is changing somebody's life forever. All of these are going to be probably stories that you're familiar with. You've heard them over the years. You, If you were a tender of Sunday school way back when, when you was a little kid, you probably heard these stories, and they're no different today than they were then. They are still teaching those even this morning, okay? And by the way, I was supposed to brag, we are setting record attendance in our adult Sunday school class. Doug is excited about that. He's no more excited about it than I am. He's telling me how many people we've got. So if you are an adult, whatever that means, all right, but that's you. And so be here on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Doug's done a wonderful job. We're appreciative of that and uh, continue to build those numbers up, okay? Set a good example uh, for your kids and let them know they will be in love with Christ. They will love Christ as much as you love Christ. They will honor the Lord as much as you honor the Lord. They will be obedient to the commandments of God as much as you are obedient to the commandments of God, all right? Luke chapter 15 and verse 2. The Bible says this. The Pharisees and the scribes, they murmured. They started whispering in each other's ear. And they started getting on the phone and they started texting. But they left Jesus out because they didn't want him to hear what they were saying. And they said, have you heard about this guy named Jesus? And here's what they said. They said, he is, a, he is a guy who is a friend of sinners. And not only is he a friend of them, he talks to them. He cares for them. He prays with them. He heals them. He saves them. And not only that, he goes home and eats dinner with them. That's what they said. I'm not making that up. The Bible says, let me, that was in our, that was in the Jody version. Let me read the King James version that says, the Pharisees and scribes murmured saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They were outraged over the fact that Jesus loved people that they didn't deem to be worth loving. They, they wanted to talk about and murmur and complain that, Jesus was a fellow who talked to people who they didn't deem to even be worthy to talk to. And not only that, he went home and he ate with them. And it was the ultimate disrespect to these so-called religious people that the Savior, the guy who claimed to be the Savior of the world, went to the lowly, went to the blue-collar, the everyday sinners, and he communed with them and he fellowshiped with them. And the Bible says... And I've given you this in John chapter 13 and verse 8. And I said this, I asked this question, why is it important that Jesus is a friend of sinners? Now I want to say this every time. I want to reiterate this every time because I don't want you to lose sight, my friend, of how important that it is that Christ is a friend of sinners. I don't want you to come to church so much that you forget how important that it was one time that Christ was a friend to you. I don't want you to sing so many songs and so many hymns that you forget about the time that, my friend, you didn't even know a hymn. I don't want you to forget about the time when you came into church and you needed a Savior and Christ didn't overlook you. He didn't look at your past. He didn't look at your sins. He didn't look at your failed relationships. He didn't look at where you'd been, what you'd done, who you'd done it with. He didn't look at that and say, oh, no, this place is not for you. He didn't look at you and say, no, you've gone too far, done too much. He didn't say, oh, no, you've committed the ultimate. He didn't say, oh, you're some of that bunch from down there on the hop. You have no right to come to this place that's only for certain people. No, Christ was a friend to you just like he was a friend to all these other people that we're talking about over the next several weeks. Well, Peter, 
oftentimes is a lot like many of us. And Christ wanted to wash his feet. Yes, wash his feet. That's exactly why he wanted to kneel down and wash the disciples' feet to show to them that the greatest master is the greatest servant. And the Bible says in John chapter 13 and verse 8, Peter said unto him, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Peter said, well, start from my head and go all the way down. Because he wanted to be a part, my friend. What is it that Christ has done for you? Well, here's where we uh, end where we have been because in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we've read this. I want you to start with uh, verse 9 and see what Christ has done for us. He has justified us by His blood and because of that we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but Paul says, we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement, the reconciliation that brings us into a right place with Almighty God. And for that, we ought to sing the louder this morning. We ought to play the piano a little bit louder this morning. We ought to play the music a little bit louder. We ought to fellowship a little bit more lively. We ought to teach and preach, and our hearts are running over. Why? Because God has made it possible that we can be reconciled to Him and be in a right place with Him this morning. If I want to be in a right place with anybody, I want it to be with God. Amen? Amen. Because I can't be in a right place with anybody until I'm in a right place with God. You want to be the best husband that you can be to your wife? Get in the right place with God. You want to be the best wife that you can be with your husband? Get in the right place with God. You want to be the best parent to your children that God would have you to be? Then get in the right place with God. You want to be the best employee, the best employer? Then get in a right relationship with God. Outside of a right relationship with God, no relationship that you have will be the best that it can be. Amen? And so the Bible says there is a day that Christ is going to change this woman's life. In Mark chapter 5, you can also read about it in John. You can also read about it in Luke. It's in three of the four Gospels. It is a story of the woman with the issue of blood. And Mark chapter 5 introduces this story to us by saying a certain woman doesn't call this lady by name. We've got questions, yes, just like last week with the pool of Bethesda. There are many questions that we don't know the answers to. Just like with this lady, there are questions that we don't know the answer to. You say, Jody, what was her name? We don't know. If we needed to know, we would know, but apparently we don't need to know. We just know that she was a woman. And the Bible says a certain woman had an issue of blood for 12 years had suffered many things and many physicians. She'd spent all the money that she had, every resource that she had, and she did not get any better. But verse 26 said, she rather grew worse. But she heard of Jesus coming. Just like Zacchaeus. Just like blind Barnabas. They knew that Jesus was going to be passing by, and so this was their opportunity. This was their moment. A moment maybe just like today when you come into God's house knowing, knowing that you too have an issue. If I were to go around this morning and do it privately, because publicly you may not want to tell everybody, and I understand that, but if I went around as the pastor of this church and I talked to all the parishioners, all the people that I am charged by Almighty God to lead you to heaven, Yes, you got to follow me. You say, we'll never get there. I promise we will. Just hold on. We got to do it together. And the Bible says, if I were to go around and I say, what is your issue? Every person in here could tell me something that they have going on in their life. 
Everybody has an issue. Don't look to social media and say everybody else is doing so much better than me. I read something the other day that said nobody posts their failures for everybody to see. Everybody posts the filtered pictures. No one posts the imperfections. No one posts. I mean, if you were to see our family getting together for a picture, it's like, raise the camera up more. It doesn't show this as much. No, make it step back some so we don't look so big. And we will spend 15 minutes taking one picture, and then we will put it in an app, edit it, so that it makes everybody look just so-so. And then we post it. In the morning, I challenge you, as soon as you get out of bed, before you even, before you even wipe the sleep out of your eyes, take a picture of yourself and post it to Facebook. <laughs> and just say, for all of those who, who think that I never have an issue, here you go. <laughs> Nobody is going to do that. Why? We don't like to sometimes say that we have an issue. Maybe we're ashamed to say that we do. Maybe we look around and everybody else, we think, man, they must be doing so good. Let me tell you something this morning. Let me tell you the truth. Of 44 years of living, this is what I've found out. We're all in this together. Pretty much everybody's lives is pretty much the same. And we've all got an issue. We all have something that we're dealing with. And it may be different than what somebody else is dealing with, but we all know that we have an issue. And so the Bible says this woman had an issue of blood. She was hemorrhaging. We don't know the details necessarily of what the underlying cause was of this lady's medical condition, but we do know this, that her medical condition unfit her for many things that she was supposed to enjoy in life. Twelve years. Now, that's a long time to have an issue. That's a long time to be searching for an answer to a problem that you've got. Twelve years is a long time. And the Bible says that for 12 years that she had went out and it wasn't that she was lazy with it. It wasn't like she was like the man at the pool of Bethesda who just sat by the pool with an excuse that he didn't have the legs to get him in the water first. This woman was active in her going out and I'm going to go to this doctor. I'm going to go to this hospital. I'm going to do this treatment. She would have done anything and she pretty much had. But she spent all the money, and the Bible says she'd go to one doctor, and they'd say, well, let's try this, and it'll cost this much. It didn't work. She would go to another doctor. Let's try this. Give me money, and it didn't work. Maybe even she went to the magicians and paid them. Maybe she went to the soothsayers. Maybe she went to the witch doctors. I don't know who all she went to, but I do know this, that every dime she had, she spent it. And she was none the better. And not only was she not any better, the Bible says she was worse off than when she got started. And so the Bible says that Jesus was going to pass by. Now, Jesus was actually on his way to do another miracle. And by this time, the news of Christ being a healer had gotten out. And the Bible says that there were many people there. It wasn't that Jesus was just walking by himself to go heal somebody. There was hundreds maybe of people there, and they were crowding around Jesus. Everybody wanted to see him. Everybody wanted to get involved. Everybody wanted to touch him. Everybody wanted maybe to be healed, whatever it was. And so the Bible says... That this lady came in, if you look at verse 27, you'll see when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind. In other words, she wasn't wanting to be seen. She was ashamed maybe of her condition because as Cambridge says, and I, I have put it there underneath that big question mark on your outline, that her condition unfit her for all the relationships of life. What does that mean? If you go to Leviticus and you read in verse 15 in the Mosaic Law and how they were to treat these illnesses, the Bible says that if a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation, which was her normal menstrual cycle, if it run beyond the time of that, all the days of the issue of her uncleanliness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. 
As long as she has this issue, she is unclean. Well, what did that mean? It means that people didn't want to be around her because if they were around her, they too were unclean. If she were married, her husband and her, they could not come together. For the Bible says he would then not only just come with her, but he would be unclean too. Her children, if she had children, they would be deemed to be unclean. Every place that she went, people would look down upon her because she was unclean and they couldn't be, she couldn't go. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't go to the store. She couldn't go to the market. For 12 years, she had been isolated because of her uncleanliness. Well, the Bible says that's her issue. I'm, I'm saying all that. I spent 10 minutes to tell you what her issue was. And it was a terrible tragedy for her is that she had something that no one could fix. And it wasn't just an aggravation, my friend. This was a life-changing disease that she had that brought shame to her and anybody that she was associated with. And maybe the murmuring, by the way, maybe the whispering, maybe the texting of the group text, they were talking about this lady. They were saying, oh, don't get around her. I heard she has this. She's unclean. Don't get around her. You know how it is. You say, oh, I would never do that. Well, let me see your phone. Take off the passcode. Take off the face ID. Why do you have all that on there? I don't want anybody to see my phone. Why not? Well, uh... Next week, everybody's going to let me look at their phones when they come into church. I'm going to see what you've texted during the week. I'm going to see, I want to see all the failed attempts at your selfies. I want to see them all, okay? I want to see all of Bob's failed attempts at selfies this week, all right? And so, yeah, I'll bring the hammer, the same one that I rectified the problem with uh, Parker's phone, okay? The Bible says this. There was a big crowd around Christ, and this lady wasn't wanting to make a spectacle out of herself. She wasn't wanting to talk to Christ. She didn't want to communicate with him. She didn't want to ask the disciples if she could be healed. So she was going to sneak in. This had to be some sort of a, a planned situation. Remember, she's unclean. She shouldn't have been there anyway. She was taking a risk by just even being among the crowd. And the Bible says that she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garments, then I'll be healed. And she believed that. And you need to understand, she believed that with all of her heart. And Christ is going to commend her here in just a minute of her faith. What is her faith? Her faith was is that she believed with all of her heart and no doubting that if she could touch the fringes of his garment, she would be cleansed. She believed that. Was it a perfect belief? It was in one sense, but it was ill-aligned in another. We know that there was no healing power in the fringes of his garment. Just like when we anoint people, the Bible says in the book of James, if any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church to anoint them. Well, there's no power in that oil. Where do we get that oil from? Does God drip that oil down from heaven? No. We just go to the same place you get your cooking oil. It's just oil. We've got some right here. Is there any difference in that oil and the oil you cook with? No, it's the same oil. Was the power in the hands of the deacons? No. Is it in the hand of the pastor? No. Well, why then do we do it if it doesn't work? But it does work. How does it work? We're by faith doing what Christ has told us to do and by our obedience to putting that oil on our hands and laying it on that person, the Bible says that we believe and trust that the God of heaven and earth hears our prayers, sees our obedience, and by His power, those people are healed. It's not by the oil. If it was the oil, then you could just, anybody could just, any unbeliever could go to Food City and get some extra virgin olive oil and douse it over. I'm healed. No. 
Our faith is in Christ. Our faith is in the healing power of Almighty God. Well, this lady was a little misaligned because she thought, I, all I got to do, maybe she thought it was like magic. Well, if I can just touch, then maybe a little bit of what he's got will come off of me and I'll be healed. She believed. She believed. She did believe. Did she understand fully what it was all about? No. Did she maybe fully understand about salvation, the changing of your heart, the new creature? No. Did she fully understand the prophetic nature of Christ coming into the world to seek and to save that which was lost? No. Had she read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? No. Had she attended worship and she did she know all about theology and all about uh, the scriptures? And No. But the one thing she had was she had a belief. And she had a belief that said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. Straightway, the Bible says, when she got there and she touched the hem of his garment, straightway means immediately. Immediately upon touching the hem of Jesus' garment, the Bible says that she was healed of that plague. She was no longer bleeding. She was no longer in an unclean state after 12 years. And let me tell you something about that 12 years. The one thing that I've noticed, I met a guy the other day, I was exercising. I've been telling people this week, when I've told them this story, I am the fattest guy who exercises every day that you will ever see. I don't know what it is. I mean, many of you have seen me walking, running, jogging, skipping, hopping, whatever I can do, and, and look at this. I'm like the one with the issue of blood, but I rather grew worse. <laughs> and I was walking the other day in the park, and there, and I felt like that, you know, you get that sense, like somebody, and, and I had my headphones on, so I couldn't hear nothing. I was walking, probably panting for bread. You know how that goes. And, and, I, and I turned around, and there was a guy coming up right behind me. He took out his earbuds. Well, out of courtesy, I took out my earbuds. And he got right up to me, and he looked at me, and he said, What's your name? Well, Johnny Wooten. <laughs> and, I, and I said, <laughs> I'd, I'd say that because he answered the phone the other day, and they said, Jody, thanks for calling me back. And he said, yeah, what can I help you? He was acting like me, so I should have acted like him, but I said, my name is Jody. He said, I knew that was you. Well, at this point in the story, I didn't know where we were going, if I was going to get mugged, shot, worse. And But I started after I seen him, he said, we went to school together. He said, I was a couple years behind you. I said, okay. And I, I, I got to, I, I then jogged my memory of who he was. And I, I do remember him. And we were, we were talking and all this stuff. And I'm telling you, within a half a mile, he had brought me up to speed of where we were at when I was 18 and left him until we're now 42 and 44. I, I pretty much knew a lot about him. And he had told me about a divorce. He told me where he worked, how much money he made about his kids and them playing sports. And, and I mean, this was from Prairie Central High School to the tennis courts. <laughs> and, and we had a great conversation. It was good. And I even shook his hand afterwards. I said, pal, I said, the next time I'm in the park walking and you are too, we'll walk together again. But you know what I, what I, I guess thought about in the big sense of all of that? As he told me, he said, I've not been in Prairie Central High School since 1998. And I thought about time and how time slips and time and time and time. And that many people have an issue that they carry around far too long. They have an issue that they don't deal with. They have an issue that they hide. They have an issue that they cover up. They have an issue that they ignore. They have an issue that almost becomes like a callus. 
It's not as sensitive anymore. It doesn't hurt as much. It doesn't sting as much because you've, you've, you've basically failed to do anything about the issue and you're still packing the issue around. And because you're still doing that, now you're just, it's just a, it's just a callus. And, and so I, I thought about God, don't let, if we've got an issue this morning, if people have an issue this morning, then let's bring it to you. This is the day that Christ can change all of our lives. Not just, don't look at it this morning like, well, I wonder if anybody's here that's on their way to hell. And I hope that if they are, they get saved. That is not the only reason that we're here. Do you know that most of the people that are here this morning are on their way to heaven? It's church. I mean, right? I mean, this is not the bar. This is not a club. It's not a concert. It's not a party. This is church. Most of the people here are on their way to heaven. But just because you're on your way to heaven doesn't mean that you don't have an issue. This woman had an issue, and for 12 years. And so... We'll talk about what those issues are here in a minute. Hey, listen, you didn't sing a choir song. I got an extra five minutes. Are we going to get out five minutes early? What do you think? (laughs) Now, you can either take your time and I have a shorter amount of time, or you don't take your time and I take everybody's time. You know how that's how that works. The Bible says the fountain of her blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that the virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, if you'll go to the book of Luke sometime and read this story, Peter opens his big mouth. And Peter said, Well, Jesus, there's a thousand people here. How in the world are we? How do we know who touched you? There's been hundreds of people touched you. There's five people got their hands on you right now. And Peter kind of, he, he was like, Lord, we, we, how do we know? We don't know. And I started thinking this week, of all the people that touched Christ at the same time this woman did, why her and not all them? I mean, if all of those people had touched Christ, if all of those people were wanting to have a side of him, if all of those people wanted to get, a, get a, into a relationship with, or, or in a communication with him, if all of them wanted to touch him and shake his hand, then why don't we read about them? And why don't we read about this woman who we don't even know her name? And the reason we do that is because of her faith. It separated her from all the other people that touched him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 that faith is the assurance or the substance of things hoped for. It's the the assurance that we know that what we hope for is reality. My faith is not wishy-washy in the sense that, oh, I hope there's a heaven. This is the, I hope, I hope, I believe in Jesus and he's right. I hope Jesus died for me because if he didn't, I'm in trouble. That's not faith at all. The faith you need to have this morning says, I know Christ died for me. You need to have the faith like Job. Job said, I know my my Redeemer liveth and that one day I'll see him for myself and not another. There was no wavering in that. You got to know. It's the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says, Paul wrote one time, and I believe it was over in Corinthians, Paul said that we do not, we do not believe in the things that we can see. We believe in the things that are unseen. I didn't see Christ die for me. I don't, I've never seen heaven. And I don't believe anybody else has either. I believe with all, in the sense that these people say, oh, I, I, for five seconds I was in heaven and come back. Well, I tell you what, that's a bad trick by God if he ever lets me go to heaven and come back to this place. If I have to go to heaven on Sunday and come back to work on Monday, I'm mad. <laughs> amen? And all the employees said amen, some louder than others. What was it about her? My friend, she believed that if she got there and could do it, if I can touch him, if I could touch him, Notice what one commentator said 
right in the middle of the second page of the outline. The multitudes thronged him, but the woman touched him. The woman touched him. Everybody else was there with unbelief. But this woman, she believed that Christ could deal with her issue. And that he did. Let's conclude. The Bible says in verse 32, he looked around to see what he had done or to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, which is a comforting term, just as a father would love his daughter and nurture her and bring her in and hug her and love her unconditionally. Jesus used that phrase to refer to this woman. And he said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of the plague. The day that Jesus changed her life. She was never the same from that moment on. I don't know what she did. The Bible doesn't give us any indication of what she would go on to do, but I can't help but believe that she went on to be a disciple of Christ. She believed. And now her belief was not in a magic trick. Her belief was not in some soothsayer. Her belief was not in some magic eight ball or some globe that she could look at. Her belief was not in some witchcraft. Her belief was now that, yes, it had to be. This is the Son of God. He has changed my life forever because of my faith in Him. And so I ask you, and I put that in big, bold letters this morning, that what is your issue? What is your issue? From the front to the back. You say, Jody, what's your issue? Don't think, my friend, and I know you probably don't, but don't think for a second that a preacher is exempt from issues. <laughs> don't think just because I, I'm the pastor of the church, so he must never have a problem. Just come to my house. It takes that long for us to sit down and tell you about it. We all have an issue. And I thought about the people that are battling with cancer. That's an issue. I thought the people that have got workplace problems. That's an issue. People that have marital problems. That's an issue. People that have kids that have gone astray. That's an issue. People that financially are burdened right now. That's an issue. I don't know what your issue may be, what your anxiety is over, what your cares and worries are about, but I do know this, that all of us have something. All of us have something, and for you to say you have nothing, you're, you're making your issue a callous. You're trying to hide it, cover it, ignore it. And so what I would like to see happen this morning, whether or not it will, is up to you. But I would like to see us bring our issues to the Lord. Well, how am I going to do that? I would ask that you move this morning. You say, I don't like to do that. Oh, I know. You're Baptist. I can tell. I like to just come in and sit and do my thing, go home, come back, sit, do my thing. You wear out the spot in your pew. I understand that. I know that. I'd like to see you move. Where are we moving to? I'd like to see you move to the altar of God. And because here's the reason I'd like to see you move. The Bible says that faith, if it doesn't have works, it's what? It's dead. Now, if this woman would have believed that Jesus could heal her and she stayed at the house that day, she would have died with that issue of blood. Her issue would have never being not an issue. But the only reason that she got healed, the only reason she was made whole is because her faith moved her. Now, if your faith in God doesn't move you, then your faith in God is dead. So you can't walk out of here this morning and say, well, I had an issue. But I didn't bring it to the Lord. But I believe in God. Well, then, my friend, your faith in God is dead if it has not works attached to it. And you can go somewhere else where they may not tell you that, but while you're here, let me tell you the truth. That the faith that you have in Almighty God should produce works in you. Amen? And so 
as Kyle comes this morning and we begin to play uh, on the invitation, you can come on up, Kyle, and as soon as he gets up here, he can start to play. We are five minutes early. I want a trophy, all right? But maybe there is a reason.